Good morning. Good to see you this morning. We are going to talk about the nature of people. Um, this is the lesson that was assigned to me. Um, it's going to be fun, so buckle up. Let's talk about uh, the nature of people this morning. Uh, Brother Lewis starts out, um, and he says that there were neither of the two questions, what is God and what are people, is expounded upon um, in a systematic way in Scripture. Um, so it's incumbent upon us to, to look at what Scripture, what the Bible does have to say about the nature of man. He starts off referring us to the uh, story of creation. He says it's very familiar to all of us, but it's important to rethink some of its implications, all right? The first thing is to note there is the relationship of people to the other creatures. Uh, think back in Genesis 1. Uh, it gives us the account of birds and fish being created in day 5. Day 5, day 5, I've got to make birds and fish. All okay. Uh, still works, right? Creeping things, cattle and wild animals, creation's on, on day 6. Um, at the end of creation process, of the creation process on day 6, he created us humans male and female and we're created in the image of god so hang on to that for a minute um, it is people that were given dominion over every other living thing that moves along the earth genesis 1 27 and 28 um, created last but yet given dominion over everything else um, what's dominion tell me what it means to be in charge of be in charge of you have dominion over your children when they're small? Used to. Used to. <laughs> 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 Used to. <laughs> All right. Sorry. <clears throat> um, it is people that stand at the crown of God's creation. Um, God looked at everything he had created before man. Okay, up to that point he said, it is good. Everything here is good. After he created people, he looked again and said, it's very good. So, uh, Genesis 1.31. Uh, the second, second account of creation um, is of God forming, dust, forming, forming man from the dust of the ground and breathing into his nostrils uh, the breath of life so that he became a living being. Um, Brother Lewis uh, pulls up some, uh, some terms here that he uses, nefesh, Chaya in Genesis 2-7, which is that living being translated there. <clears throat> uh, it was the man who gave names to all the other animals, but no creature was found that would satisfy the need of man. So from the rib of the man, God formed the woman to be a help to man, corresponding to the man, okay? The way that he put that, um, God formed the woman to be a help to man, corresponding to to the man, I've never heard it said that way before, but it uh, it, it opened my eyes to a couple of things that we'll, we'll hang on to. Uh, he also goes on to say that it is in marriage um, that the man and the woman become one flesh. And so he, he references that in, in Scripture. Um, certain aspects of man are not said of the creeping things and animals and birds. Okay, Only man is it said to have been made in the image and the likeness of God. Um, this aspect is only said of man. Um, and, and Brother Lewis says it's not certain all that is involved in the ideas of image and likeness. And he lists the power of choice, longing after God, conscience, um, are, are some other possibilities. And he says there are probably a whole lot more. Um, what do you think it means to be made in the image and the likeness of God? What comes to mind? Awareness. Awareness. Sentience, right? I'm alive. I'm here. Knowledge. Knowledge. Blessedness. Blessedness? Interesting. I like that. Anybody else? Uh, apparently, yeah. we're, we're the only part of God's creation that can contemplate our end and think about it and worry about it and do whatever. <laughs> and hopefully take action to, to uh, put it off, right? Back to awareness. <laughs> Possibly love, because God is love. And the animals, you might think that they love their offspring, but that could be just instinct. But we have the ability to love. Well, my puppy dog loves me. I'm here to tell you. <laughs> um, Tracy, did you say that 
image and likeness of God. The image and likeness of God, yeah. I, I, I believe it, but I think it's the same uh, related to our children. They should reflect, when we're striving to please God, our children should reflect that in their life. And sometimes, I was just thinking about my son, and certainly uh, children are children, but uh, I realized that the things that I've been trying to get over to him, that I can see them uh, in the things that he say and the things that he do, even though he does some things that say and do things that I wouldn't like for him to do. But I can see those things that uh, I strive to, you know, to, to teach him or to demonstrate, uh, to do, you know, certain things. So that's how I see it, the image and likeness of God in that our children is reflecting things that we want to please God you, know, you hang on to that Billy um, and, and we'll we'll uh, we'll get into some of those aspects uh, a little bit a little bit later actually it's a pretty good lead-in yes sir were you done with the chef help yourself <laughs> well I mean that actually is a hotly debated topic okay because the question is uh, is to be made in God's image does that relate to our form or does that relate to our function and a lot of people would say, well, that means just as God is sovereign and he rules the universe, he's given his image to us to have sovereignty in creation. And so we have dominion over the earth. And so, you know, they argue that contextually. You know, others argue from the standpoint of form. Uh, well, if it's form, what does it mean? Well, it is clear that animals have instincts, but animals aren't merely instinctual beings. I mean, they can make choices, and that's clear just by observing, mm -hmm. you know, animal behavior. So, I mean, it seems like what it would mean if it's form is the fact that we are the only beings. Now, an issue with this is angels are never described as being in God's image. It's not to say that they're not, but they're never described in that way. Mm -hmm. True. But if it's form, it probably means that we're the only part of this material creation that have spirits that are able to relate to God. You know, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, with their spirits and in truth. And so it, it enables us to have a relationship with him. Um, so Brother Lewis was right. There are many, many more things about being made in the image and likeness of God than he talked about. So thank you all for your your uh, additions there. Hang on to that as well. Um, Next, only humans, um, is it said that God breathed into their nostrils the breath of life. And the, uh, the Hebrew uh, term there is nishmat chayim. N nishmat chayim, yeah, that's a mouthful. Um, animals breathe and their life comes from and is, is sustained by God, but it is not said <coughs> that God breathed into them. Uh, Psalms 104.29 says, When you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they, re they die and return to the dust. Um, the the uh, next thing is the land animals and sea creatures are created male and female with the command to multiply and fill the earth. But only of woman is there a story of special creation with rules for marriage uh, given and spelled out there. Uh, the psalmist says, when his breath departs, he returns to his earth. On that very day, his plans perish, Psalms 146, verse 4 in the RSV. Uh, mortals cannot abide in their pomp. They, like the animals that per they are like the animals that perish, Psalms 49, verse 12. Yet people are very different from other creatures, and we've talked about some of those things specifically. Uh, Brother Lewis points out here some things that, uh, that, that kind of end up shaping our thinking that's good to know. The, the King James Version translates uh, the nefesh chaya as a living soul, Genesis 2-7, when it refers to people, but not when referring to animals. Thereby, the King James Version invited people to suppose that this is a term distinguishing people from animals. They could argue that people have living souls, but animals do not. However, the Hebrew account does not support this distinction. It only comes by the King James Version policy of using a variety in, using variety in translating terms. Anif animals are also the same term, nefesh chaya, Genesis 1, 20, I'm sorry, Genesis 1, verse 20, 
21, 24, and 30 there in, in chapter 1. The term merely means an animated being, that's something that is alive. Uh, but the King James Version used living creatures, and there is life for the animals. God's covenant after the flood was with every living creature uh, coming out of the ark. Um, a lot of times our, our, our thinking is shaped by the way we read things, and um, I didn't really realize that the, the King James Version uh, made that distinction um, as it was, as it was uh, translating, so I thought that was worth mentioning. Um, the creation story has implications about the special place of woman and about God's plans for marriage that we must not ignore. Uh, Jesus himself discussed marriage and divorce, and it was to this story, the uh, creation story, that he referred. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Matthew 19, 4 and 5. When Malachi spoke of marriage abuse, he asks, Did not one God create us? Malachi 2.10 Abusers of wives and of the marriage relationship are warned in Hebrews. And this is a quote, Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the immoral and the adulterous. Hebrews 13.4 The creation story also has important social implications that the entire human race goes back to one pair. The Bible has no explanation to the origin of the races, but does speak to the brotherhood of all people. All go back to a common origin. God made of one blood all nations, Acts 17, 26. Not only do all come together in Adam, but also come together again in Noah. The Bible gives no ideas of a superior race or to ideas of a race inferior by nature. Um, this is a, it's pretty relevant stuff he's talking about now to what's going on in our culture today. And uh, you know, we're reminded that uh, we're all one. We're all, we all come from the same place. We all come from the same God. We're all made the same way. We all have the same blood. The psalmist places people before angels and creatures of the earth when he asks God, What is man that you are mindful of him? And that's Psalms 8, 4. And here he answers, he says, You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. All flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea, all that swim in the paths of the sea. Psalms 8, 5 through 8. What is man indeed? Along with this exaltation of people, there's an emphasis on the creatureliness of people and temporariness of their stay on earth. Temporariness. Lord, what are human beings that you care for them, mere mortals that you think of them? They are a breath. Their days are like a fleeting shadow. Psalms 144, verses 3 and 4. We are, our days are but a fleeting shadow. Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures, Yet all the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass, and we fly away. Psalms 90, verse 10. All flesh is grass. Isaiah 46 and 7, 51, 12, and 1 Peter 1, 24. Man's days are like grass. Psalms 103, 15. Notice the comparison to dust in Genesis 3, 9. Breath and shadow. Psalms 102, 11, 144, verse 4, and Ecclesiastes 8, 13, and to grass. Um, scripture has a lot to say uh, equating flesh to those things that are very, very temporary. Flesh in the Old Testament is the essence of people and is in contrast with the power and enduring nature of God, who is spirit. My spirit shall not abide in people forever, for they are flesh, Genesis 3, 6. God remembers that we're but flesh, a wind that passes and comes not again. Psalms 78, 39. The Egyptians are men and not God, and their horses are flesh and not spirit. Isaiah 31, 3. Cursed is the one who trusts in people. Jeremiah 17, 5. 
Brother Lewis talks about the, the temporal weakness of people has to be reckoned with, but also with the human inability to guide itself aright. People were created upright, but have sought out many inventions. Ecclesiastes 7.29 I know, O Lord, that the way of man is not in himself, that it is not in man who walks to direct his steps. Jeremiah 10.23 there is a way which seems right to a person, but its end is the way of death. Proverbs 4.12 and 16.25. The psalmist says, If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? Psalms 130, verse 3. Jeremiah contrasts the instincts guiding the migratory birds with people's waywardness. Jeremiah 8, verse 7. Scripture affirms the universal sinfulness of people, Ecclesiastes 7, 20 and 29. Enter not into judgment with thy servant, for no man living is righteous before thee. Psalms 143, 2. Solomon said in his dedication prayer of the temple, If they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin. 1 Kings 8, 46. Who can say, I have made my heart clean, I am pure from my sin. Proverbs 20, verse 9. There is no one who does not sin. There is none that does right. No, not one. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 1 John 1, 8. Yeah, he really talks about the sinfulness of man. Man was created by God with a choice, but with a duty of obedience to God, his creator. We see in the story of the Garden of Eden the prohibition from eating of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There is a right choice, but there is also the penalty for making the wrong choice. And here's a statement I want, I want you to get. People are accountable to God for their actions, inheritance, and environment. Do not excuse. People are accountable to God for their actions, inheritance, and environment. Do not excuse. And that runs runs counter to our culture these days. But clearly, that's what, that's what Scripture tells us. Since the time of Origen and Augustine, the doctrine of original sin has loomed large in Christian thought. It later became one of the pillars of Calvinism and continues to exercise influence today. According to this teaching, people by Adam's sin lost their ability to do right. They are born with the guilt of Adam's sin. One must notice that the story in Genesis 3 with its statement to the woman, to the serpent, and to the man do not set forth this consequence, nor is it drawn any place else in the Old Testament. Noah, being a descendant of Adam, does not seem to have, it does not seem to have robbed him of his ability to do right. Okay? Though the wickedness of Noah's generation is proverbial, Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his gener generation. Genesis 6, verse 9. <clears throat> Paul declared, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death came through sin, so death spread to all, because all have sinned. Romans 5, 12. To make this passage fit his theory, Augustine modified the verse to read, in whom all have sinned, that is, in Adam all have sinned. But this passage does not say that. A further proof, proof text has been claimed from the statement of David. I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me, Psalms 51.5. And Brother Lewis says, rather than making a universal out of this statement, I propose that David is using hyperbole to explain why he had committed the sin that he had committed. Jesus taught, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 19, 14. Something else I, I did not realize. Early Christians did not believe in inherited original sin. Aristides, an apologist of the second century, said of Christians, When a child has been born to one of them, they give thanks to God. And if, moreover, it happens to die in childhood, they give thanks to God the more as for one who has passed through the world without sins. Never heard that before. 
born into a world where sin runs rampant, people yield to temptation. Amen. At death, the body returns to the earth, but the spirit returns to the God who gave it, Ecclesiastes 2.7. The New Testament says there is an outer nature and an inner nature, 2 Corinthians 4.16. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell, Matthew 10, 28. Paul can pray that the Thessalonians be saved body, soul, and spirit at the Lord's coming. That's 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. Though the word pride does not occur in abundance in the Old Testament, human pride becomes a major cause of human failure. The serpent tempts Eve with a fruit by which she can be like God knowing good and evil, Genesis 3, 4, and 5. Early in the story after the flood, people are proposing to build a tower from earth to heaven to make a name for themselves, Genesis 11, verse 10. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall, Proverbs 16, 18. Pride stands in the way of man obeying God, and God threatens to break Israel's pride if she does not obey him, Leviticus 26, 18 and 19. In arrogance, the wicked persecute the poor, Psalms 10, 2. Pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate, Proverbs 8, 13, says the Lord. A person's pride will bring humiliation, but the one who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor, Proverbs 29, 23. He says, in particular, the Hebrew prophets denounce pride. But in pride and arrogance of heart, they said, The bricks have fallen. We will build with dressed stones. Isaiah 9, 9 and 10. Pride was the sin of Sodom in Ezekiel 16, verse 49. Isaiah has an extensive section of the Lord's humbling of all that is haughty. The haughty eyes of people shall be brought low. And the pride of everyone shall be humbled. And the Lord alone will be exalted on that day. For the Lord of hosts has a day against all that is proud and lofty, against all that is lifted up and high, against all the cedars of Lebanon, lofty and lifted up, against all the oaks of Bashan, against all the high mountains, against all the lofty hills, against every high tower, against every fortified wall, against the ships of Tarshish, against all the beautiful craft. The haughtiness of people shall be humbled, and the pride of everyone shall be brought low, for the Lord alone will be exalted on that day. Isaiah 2, verses 11 through 17. Quite a, uh, quite a narrative against, uh, against haughtiness and pride. The Gospel writer lists pride among the sins that proceed from the heart and defile a person, in Mark chapter 9, verses 22 and 23. Paul calls on people not to think more highly of themselves, of themselves than they ought to think, Romans 12, 3. But he calls for sober judgment, not for thinking less highly than one should. He calls for sober judgment. And he makes a statement here that I, I want us to take note. People's task is is to humble themselves into a complete and total surrender of the will of God for them, a goal that all of us find hard to reach. Again, people's task is to humble themselves into a complete and total surrender to the will of God for them, a goal that all of us find very hard to reach. Paul sets the goal to be to be that of being renewed in the image of God, put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator, Colossians 3.10. Peter speaks of partaking of the divine nature. He says, through these he has given us, through scripture he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires, 2 Peter 1.4. The Hebrew writer tells believers to live as pilgrims here on earth. Hebrews 11, 13. 
Brother Lewis takes us from uh, the story of creation and, and how he has made us the pinnacle of creation. We're, we're made in the image and likeness of God and all that that entails um, is upon us. And he walks through scripture talking about the nature of people and the story seems to get worse and worse. Um, the, the nature of people um, we're born right, we're born good, we're born pure, but we all fall, we all slide into, into temptation, and we all fall. And so to, uh, to wrap this up, I was trying to find what's a, what's a good way to wrap this up, and, and so I will, uh, in closing, I will, I will leave this with you. This is a, a little narrative I found. Can social involvement and spirituality come together? Actually, the real question, according to George Grant, is whether they can ever be separated. Justice without mercy or mercy without justice or either without spiritual humility are biblically impossible. Ever since the Garden of Eden, mankind has bounced with extremes. Without God's guidance and decrees providing balance and sanity, human nature destroys itself. The message of the prophet Micah is a powerful appeal for Christians to forge the bond between inner principles and outward conduct. Micah 6, 8, and he calls it the Micah Mandate, gives a balanced answer to today's spiritual and political questions. What does the Lord require of you, O man? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. I have some friends on Facebook, one fellow in particular, I uh, went through went through ACU with him, and he's a fine man. And for some reason, he decided to uh, spend his career practicing law. So yes, there is at least one one Christian man out there practicing law, and he's uh, he's now a, a professor of of uh, criminology, I think, at at Lubbock Christian. And uh, in his posts, he's always asking, he's always pleading to. Uh, same as here is to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And I find that extremely refreshing um, in talking about our interactions, especially when it comes to the things that come up on social media. Anybody have any, any questions or comments they want to throw in here? The only thing I don't understand is the believer should live as a pilgrim. Would you explain that to me? Um, this is not our home. This is not this is not where my heart is. Um, I have to live here, but my time here is temporary. Um, as he talks about, it's but a shadow, but a but a fleeting wind that flies away. Our, our time here on this earth is is not is not permanence, and it's not where I want to be. Um, every morning when I get out of bed, my back hurts. Um, do I hear a groan or an amen back there? This is not where I want to be. Um, and so uh, the, the, the people that, that came before us, our forebearers in Scripture, uh, they knew that, and they knew that the time was coming for Christ to come, and a lot of them never saw it. But this, this place is not our home. This is not where we're going to be. This is but uh, a, a, quick, a quick stopover on our journey towards where we're going to spend the most of our time. So that's, that's what that admonishment means. And it's a beautiful thing to admonish. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Just a quick follow-up on what you said. Since it says our citizenship is in heaven. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? All right. Well, I appreciate you. Um, Brother Lewis goes through here, and he throws out a lot of ideas, a lot of concepts. Uh, this chapter is only a, uh, a few pages long, but it's jam-packed full of, uh, of information, and he, he jumps from topic to topic, and um, his message is, is very concise. It's hard to go through and, and read a paragraph of his, okay, I'm going to summarize that. Well, he's already summarized it for me. So I just, uh, I just have to take what he says and kind of move on. But... Uh, it's a, it's a great story.